You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Wow, what a crowd. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Okay, so uh, this is our first live in front of an audience uh, Ask a Gettysburg Guide. And, of course, we're not doing Gettysburg Guides today. Well, we have a guide with us, but we're not asking him anything. Um, we have with us Gettysburg Actors. That's right. From the local playhouse here in Gettysburg. No, they're uh, actually from the movie Gettysburg. Um, and we'll get to them in a moment. But first, I want to thank you all for coming out. This is, uh, I, I honestly was shocked that this sold out in 48 hours. I expected it to take maybe 48 days, so I <laughs> I uh, put it out early. And uh, that was great that you guys did that. And we really appreciate that. It means a lot to us. Um, and we don't really have the words to express, to express just how much it means to us. But thank you very much. So let's give yourselves a round of applause for being fantastic. There are some celebrities in the crowd tonight. Probably the biggest one of them is sitting right here. <laughs> is sitting right uh, to my right here. Uh, you know him, you love him, the great Cam Mallow, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Mountain folklorist from West Virginia, that's who he is. Uh, also, where'd he go? Where's six questions? Oh, there he is. All right, all right. There's six questions, Lentz is over there writing six questions down. Okay, six questions, Lentz, ladies and gentlemen. Big star. Big star. And don't forget Becky. She's right in front of us here. Big star for Becky. All right. Big applause. Yeah, there you go. All right. Who else we got? We got Wild Bill Etzcorn over there. Wild Bill. Ty DeWitt from 1863 Designs. Uh, he does uh, our, some logos for us and things. Dave Johnson from Gettysburg Images. You all know and love his photographs on Instagram, and there he is right there. In the way back there, we got Lewis Trott, who takes us out on our Get Out of the Car tours. So thank you very much for that, Lewis. Uh, you've become quite a star in your own right. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Uh, and if you're in the book club, uh, Stephen Byers, the leader of the book club, is here. Steve Byers, thank you very much. And probably uh, everybody's, uh, we, we call her Gettysburg sweetheart. Ladies and gentlemen, Veronica Ronnie Brzezinski in the back there. <laughs> Along with Kath, her mom, who you've all heard of, but no one's allowed to meet her. <laughs> Okay, and then sitting next to Ronnie is uh, Gettysburg's favorite s smut author, <laughs> who you who you uh, who you heard on AG today a couple weeks ago, <laughs> Victoria Vicky Castle. Sorry, hello, Vicky Castle. All right, enough with that. It's back to us now. Uh, Tim Smith here is uh, is my sit-in co-host today. And Tim, why are you? Let's get into this right now. Why are you so qualified to sit here and talk about the movie as it pertains to the Farnsworth House? Mm, qualified is a strange word. Um, I was not. In you the wrote movie. it. I had absolutely nothing to do with the movie. Um, but I think there's three reasons why I'm here. All right. Uh, one of them was because in the um, summer and fall of 1992, 30 years ago. <laughs> Shut up. Um, <laughs> I was a young battlefield guide, and uh, I lived next to the Farnsworth house. I was very good friends with the owners, and uh, uh, I spent a lot of my Friday and Saturday nights drinking with the actor. <laughs> well, that'll do it. That's probably my number one, uh, uh, you know, uh, qualification for being here. That, uh, and, and, you know... Uh, the Were you actors, allowed to go to the set at all? Did any of them say, hey, I, you're a cool guy, come to the set tomorrow? I was, I was on the set one time. Um, it was when I took... Uh, I gave some wives of some of the actors uh, a tour. Um, uh, the 
the color bearer of the 20th Maine, Andrew Tozier, um, was played, uh, I, boy, I forget his name, but his wife organized a tour for some of the actors' okay. wives, and I took him around, and then we went on the set. Oh, nice. But um, the other qualification is the fact that, um, you know, you may know I live at the Farnsworth House, or yes. next door to the Farnsworth House, and... Uh, uh, the staff probably um, ruse this fact, but it is generally my job to turn the movie Gettysburg on and <laughs> turn the movie Gettysburg over. And uh, I so is that why they shudder every time they hear your name? And uh, you're the guy I that often tortures sit them. Sit and watch the movie, and you know I used to hang out here. I and you know the movie's been playing here almost since the time the movie was filmed, and. I honestly believe that I have seen the movie more times than any other living person. Yeah. And then uh, thirdly, since I'm a battlefield tour guide and I take visitors around the battlefield, you know, thousands of visitors I've taken on the battlefield. And a lot of visitors prepare uh, their Gettysburg trip by watching the movie. Or oftentimes groups of eighth graders, which I've done thousands of groups of eighth graders, especially from like Ohio, they'll watch the movie on their way here. Mm. And uh, every one of them wants to give me their review of the movie. <laughs> so so I, ha I am the person who is filled with thousands of regular people who've seen the movie and I know what they like about it and what they don't like about it and you know they've told me about it so yeah so I have that a collective you know review okay from all these and what's the third reason well that Isn't was that two reasons. that was three reasons I fell asleep <laughs> I'm sorry <laughs> No, no, no. That's not against you. It's me. I just I doze off in the middle of the day. All right. So and then uh, so okay. Go ahead. You were going to say something else. No. Oh, good. Great. <laughs> cool. Uh, so there's a, there's a series here. Yeah, yeah. There's some kind of something going on here. And you know, um, <laughs> I, one one th interesting thing about the, mo the movie. You know, people ask me about it all the time. Uh, you know, having said that I've seen it more than any other living person is kind of interesting uh, in its own right. And people ask me, well, you know, watch the movie all the time. Do you like it? Oh, that's a good question. And, you know, I, I don't know if I ever even consider whether I like it or not. Hmm. Um, I talk about it every day. You know, people ask me about it every day. What was um, it that you said to yourself uh, back when the movie well, came you out? Know, after it first came out and I started to realize that people were going to ask me about it and it was more part of my job to talk about the movie. Uh, and, you know, to me, it didn't matter if the movie was good or the movie was bad or I liked it or I didn't like it. I knew that I would be talking about it for the rest of my <laughs> life. <laughs> <laughs> you told me a story uh, a couple of weeks ago about you know, this guy. I would say that, you know, just generally, I can tell you what people really like about the movie and what they don't. But the number one thing I think that people like about the movie is the music. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my. That soundtrack is really good. And uh, uh, I told you that one of my yeah. weird memories about the soundtrack is, you know, um, there was this guy I took on a tour just a single guy in a car and I was driving and he put the movie Gettysburg soundtrack on while I was talking <laughs> <laughs> and, and kept turning it up <laughs> trying to drown you out you know so that as I was giving the narrative he could, he he could feel it to the soundtrack yeah oh I mean, I do. Uh, I'll play that or the Glory soundtrack driving around the battlefield sometimes, but never with a guide in the car. That's that's something else. All right. Well, so we're going to talk about uh, the movie as it pertains to the Farnsworth House. We're going to get in a little bit of the Farnsworth House, and we're going to play a little game with our audience. we got a lot to do, so let's get to our guests today. First of all, from he come, came all the way here from Los Angeles yesterday, and man, did he have an ordeal. Uh, not an ordeal, an odyssey, I think is the word I'm thinking of. Wasn't that that old Greek thing about the guy going all over the place? Whatever. He had an odyssey yesterday. Uh, he played General Hill Hood in the movie uh, Gettysburg. <laughs> Take two. <laughs> he, he played General Hood in the movie Gettysburg. And uh, he's somebody that uh, I call friend. Patrick Gorman, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> How was the flight? Yesterday, was, oh, you got to talk in the mic there, Patty. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yes, yes, the flight was fine. No, the flight was fine. 
Yeah. But I had. I, it's up. It's on. Hear? You just got to speak into the end of it. The end of it, like yeah. this. That, yeah. There you go. Okay. Uh, no, the technology. All right. You still can't hear. Now you can hear. Sorry, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm so it involved in my turn headphones. It on. It really does help yes. to turn it on, and not too. To cl- okay. All right. Though I, I have one comment about the flight. I haven't been on a flight in three years. At LAX and at the other place here in New Jersey, what was it? Newark. It was Newark, yes. I have this. I had no eye contact hardly with anyone except the ticket takers. Everybody is on their cell phone. Mm. And I'm watching all this and I'm think, has it changed that much in three years? And it has, folks, in case you hadn't noticed. Yeah, and of course, I come here, nobody's got a mask. Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Oh God. Where I live, everybody's got a mask. You can't go into Denny's or McDonald's or anywhere without a mask and reporting your ID and everything. And I'm, I had my shots. I had my shots. Yeah. And the boat. <laughs> Papers. And then we come here and it's cold. God, I hate that. Yeah. But, uh, but, Me too. Let's go, Brandon. Yes. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. What, what I, 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 I'm glad you were muted. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the flight was it, the flight was nice. Yeah. But it took forever to drive here, and there was no pro, there was no traffic. Friday night, five o'clock, people get off work, right? Yeah. I expected it to be bumper to bumper traffic, like from Dallas. There was hardly anybody on the road. We got here endlessly, nevertheless, but it was, <laughs> it was it was fine. Yeah. And I got to sleep. At the Farnsworth house. How good is that? Yes, I know. And they did a really nice job there. They certainly did. You got yourself a gift I don't basket. I not eat anymore. They left me enough goodies there. Yeah. All they have to do is give me an apple and some chocolate on it. Fun. Yeah. And a cigar. You got a cigar, too. I got a cigar. Yeah, that was nice. Like cigars, yes. Well, thank you for coming out, Patrick. And I'd like to thank Peter Bonfanti over there for uh, driving you. He picked you up at Newark and drove you all the way down here. Yes. He's a real mensch. Absolutely. Thank you, Peter. Known that kid for 40 years, <laughs> and I'm only 43. Our next guest is uh, someone who you know from the show. Uh, he's been on several times. I can't get rid of him. But I also uh, <laughs> I also call this fellow friend because uh, he, he's here part time uh, uh, during the year. Like, you know, so we, we hang out. We have a lot of fun together. You know him as Major Taylor, the flapjack king of, uh, <laughs> of the Army of Northern Virginia. But uh, we know him as Bo Brinkman, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. And Bo, you just flew in today. Yes. Oh, wait, I, did, I keep making this. Sorry, I just got this new board and I'm not used to it all. So forgive me, folks. You just got in today. There you go. From Houston. From Houston. Which, what's the weather down there? Uh, almost like it is right now here. Oh, it is? Oh, yeah. Oh, so then like I'm not Three days ago, it was 83 degrees. Oh, well, then I'm you moving. Know, I had the AC on and I woke up the next morning. It was uh, 39 so that's Houston. You poor thing. <laughs> that's terrible. <laughs> LA is going to be 80 next week. 80, oh, 80 degrees on you. Tuesday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So, so you flew in here today. I, now, I, I asked you, you called me a couple of weeks ago and you said, uh, What's the day of the show? I said, 26. And you go, Okay, I'm going to fly in on the 26th. I go, well, No. <laughs> fly in on the 25th. Why? Well, what if something goes wrong? You know, I'm saying, what if something yeah, goes were, wrong? You know, I was all you worried. You kind of freaking out a little And bit. then you call me and you go, can you come and get me from BWI like an hour before we started? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, man, I need a ride. Yeah. I said, well, get a cab. <laughs> all right. So we're going to talk about uh, the movie. First, let's start with you, you guys and your careers in Hollywood and acting and all that stuff. <laughs> Patrick laughs. So, uh, Patrick, how long have you been acting? I had... What? I, I, I had my first audition for a film in 1937. 1937. For Our Gang Comedies. Wow. And I didn't get the part. Does that tell you anything about my career? <laughs> you think of me as a celebrity because of Gettysburg. I'm a journeyman actor. I do not live in Beverly Hills. I do not have a swimming pool. I do not have a a chauffeur, a private masseuse, or any such thing. <laughs> so, anyway, but I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be a celebrity in Gettysburg, as yes, General Hood. Yes, yes, Thank yes. Thank you so much. 
<laughs> but you told me this morning that you were standing outside and somebody came up to you and, and recognized you, right? Yeah, several people. I, that's amazing mm-hmm. because I don't look anything like General Hood. Well, but, but you're very accessible on your Facebook and your Instagram. People know I you. I think I posted some things on Facebook. Yeah, I did with yeah. my, my hat you and had your cigar hat. and that blah, 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 <laughs> nonsense. But, uh, but it's, it's fun. It's, it's a great, it's a, it's, it was an honor to be in the film, first of all. When I talk about that, I mean, people talk about it. It was, it was not just you know a, an acting gig. Right. It was really an honor because I had, you know, as many people here have ancestors. I had ancestors on both sides. Um, I can't tell you what regiments they had, but I have some ugly stories. <laughs> and um, so I thought it was it was very important to do, and I was honored. But I originally wanted to play Sheridan, but he wasn't in it. If I showed you the picture that I took in, I was working as a messenger. That's how bad my career was when I got this part. And I saw I I couldn't get my agent to submit me. So I took the picture, my picture, I just shaved my head and I'd let a beard grow and I looked like I had some skin disease. And I took this picture I found out where Ron Maxwell was, I didn't know him, and I delivered it as the delivery person. My picture, and I got the audition. I wanted, but there, I wanted Sheridan, because I said, well, I want to play with, I want to work with Duvall. (laughs) He's my favorite actor, I want to work with him. There's got to be something in the Civil War. I look a little bit like Sheridan in this. I I could play Sheridan, but there was no Sheridan in it. (laughs) Then I said, oh, Armitage, oh, that's the role. I want to play, I want to play Armitage. Armistead. Hermitage, no, Armitage. It was, no, they what? wanted me for Lou, uh, uh, Hood. Oh, yeah. And why? It's something in the picture, in the eyes. If I showed you the picture, if you go on Facebook, you could probably see it, or I am. Anyway, I got it, that part, and yet, Hood was the blonde giant. He was <laughs> six foot two, and broad shoulders, and a blonde beard and blonde hair. I was in my 50s or 60s, I'm five feet 10, I have no shoulders, <laughs> but I love the part. Yeah. So I'd rather play that than, yeah. I was happy to do that. But that's kind of how that happened. And you did it well. I, I did a lot of research on it, like we all do. Yep. Uh, Tom Berenger made sure we did mm-hmm. when we got here, mm-hmm. we got quizzed. But I, I did, uh, I read everything I could on it. But the great, greatest thing was, when we got here to read the script, together as a table read before they started filming. I, luckily, was not in the first week. So I was able to get my horse and go out and practice getting on the horse with the spurs and the saddle and saber and all that. I knew how to ride, but and that's, that's complicated. So, and I would go in character out to the reenactors and visit them and they would take me around and I'd have barbecue and drink and I joined a secret society and I became a, 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 a citizen of t- Texas. Yeah. I'm an honorary Texan. Right, okay. But I learned so much and I read everything that was available I could about Hood. I, re- I read it serious uh, research. But I learned all these incredible anecdotes about Hood that I never found in the history books. So that by the time I got in front of the camera, I felt very comfortable as Hood. And I, I felt that I, I, I felt that I got his essence, even though I wasn't six feet two and as young as he was. But um, that's kind of my take on that. Didn't uh, Berenger have uh, a gift for all you guys? Oh yes, um, anyone who knows me has heard that. So we get to the reading. I'd never met Bo. I'd never met any of these other actors. And while we're reading in the break. I noticed Berenger getting up and he was bringing these boxes out and they were filled with swords and they were all different. And I thought, oh, they're swords for his, all the offers, all, uh, all the yeah. generals. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, how neat. He went, he went on his, he went to the costumer and the prop man and got these. No, he had gone out and bought for each one of us and they were all different. And mine was inscribed to General, Major General John Bell Hood from uh, you know, Longstreet. Lieutenant General Indoor. James Longstreet, yeah. And the the hilt was a replica, but the blade was a ni- 1862 blade. Oh, wow. 
I, I, I didn't wear it in the film, unfortunately. Otherwise, John. Otherwise, John Pinkerton would have it. Uh, but, uh, I still. I thought. In all my years, I mean, I've done eighty some odd films and over a hundred televisions, fifteen thousand stage performances. But I never got that kind of a gift from anybody. I was really, and he did that on his own dime. Yep. So he's a movie star. He has the money. No, it doesn't matter. <laughs> but, you know, nobody has to do that. Sure. What was the? What's the one line? I think I know, but what's the one line that people come up to you and quote back in your face? Oh, the one I get the most really is, we should have gone to the right. Oh. (laughs) 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 That whole scene with with Tom and I as Longstreet and Hood, you know, which never actually happened. Right. What they, those, what, what they said happened, but it was mostly in dispatches. But in the movie, Dramatic License, it made for a good scene. But I had a lot of quotable lines there. Yeah. I, what was the one about uh, rolling rocks down? How do you, oh. I like the, how, the way you said it. Yeah. yeah. All but I got to do was sounds like this. Down. Yeah, all, all I need to do is down roll down rocks you. down on you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's it. <laughs> all I need to do is roll rocks down on you. <laughs> well, it, yeah, that, I was really lucky because there again, <laughs> It was. It felt so right that film. Yeah. Those scenes with. Well, it all comes together. Like you, it seems like every actor I talked to, even if they were just there shooting for a day, it seems like it was a a momentous occasion in their career. You know, like you guys all. It seemed to be like you tapped into like some kind of wavelength or something when you came and made this film. Does it help yeah. to be in the actual place? You know. I, I can speak only for it. it d- certainly, would yeah. it does help. Yeah. But that's our job. You know, our job is to take somebody else's words and some other person and make them us. Or yeah. Make, that's how we become we become the character. So that's that's important and that's part of the process. But of course, if you can be on the spot, that's really it brings I mean, something I'm to it. I'm not very. I, I'm not a spiritual person, or I wouldn't say, but when I got, I, I didn't, I, it's not that I don't believe in ghosts or things, but I, I'm a little more practical. I never saw a ghost or anything. The first night we were here, we didn't stay at the hotel where we eventually stayed. We stayed at a little motel on the outskirts. I can't remember the name of the town. I, I did not. Yeah, and <laughs> I, I felt, I felt well, like charged up and I t- went to the, it was late at night, and I went to the concierge, and I said, uh, I'm gonna take a walk out. I'm, Joy says, oh, he says, well, right down at the end of the street here is the edge of the battlefield, and there are the fences and all that. And I said, oh, well, great. I, I got out, and I walked, and there was the moon, and it was light, and as I got closer, I knew where everything was. Not that, of course, the trees changed from 1863 to then, but there were rocks. There were things that I knew were there before I saw them. That was weird. Hmm. And I had this feeling, I've been here. Several days later, when I was in Devil's Den, a lot of people have this experience about Devil's Den, having been there. I knew where, I knew where, what was there. I had, you know, I got, my hair stood on end. It says, I, I know this place. It's not from the pictures I saw. I mean, I knew behind the rocks what was there. Very strange. Very strange, and but very revealing. And yeah. It's very, very interesting. So how about you, Bo? Do you, uh, how did you get the part, by the way? Well. Microphone, please. <laughs> <laughs> Funny you should ask. <laughs> I had a movie uh, at the Cannes Film Festival in South France, and uh, I was at the Carlton. They have a huge outdoor restaurant at the Carlton. It's always packed during the film, you know, Cannes Film Festival. It's, and uh, I had rented a Porsche that was sitting on the curb, and we had a table right by the iron f- the fence. Right. And uh, this British guy was sitting on the hood of the car. And so I asked him, to, hey, excuse me, could you, it's a rent car, could you, could you not sit on the, 
and I was eating a salad and he goes, look at that. Oh my God, he doesn't even know how to eat a salad. <laughs> because I wasn't using my knife and fork together, you know, when you push the food, that's the way the Brits do it. So I had a couple of drinks, so I grabbed him by the th throat and I pulled him over the fence onto our table. I was young, I was stupid. <laughs> and so... Facebook text. Ron, Ron Maxwell <laughs> yeah, right. was sitting two tables down with another actor, and I mean a director. And uh, after I pushed the guy off like that, and he was like yelling obscenities and kept on walking down the sidewalk, um, I see this guy come. He says, "Come here, come here." You know, he waved me over to the table, and he goes, "You remind me of Dennis Quaid." <laughs> And I said, really? He says, yes, you did. I said, well, he's my cousin, you know? And he goes, oh, my God, I directed him in, uh, forget what, uh, I forget the movie that he directed him in, but the night the lights went out in Georgia. Okay. And so he invited me to sit down, and he said, I'm putting a movie together. You're perfect for this role. I, I, you know, are you an actor? I said, yes. He goes, you're perfect. I want you in, in this film, Gettysburg. What do you think about pancakes? That's yeah, what he, that's he the other me, thing he asked you. He, he, he did right then and there. He goes, do you like flapjacks? <laughs> <laughs> you always say yes when a director asks you something. Of course. I said, I love flapjacks. Can you ride a horse and do I you like flapjacks? I small mountains, as a matter of fact. <laughs> that's a great line. Let's put it in. <laughs> small mountains. I love it. <laughs> so, so as it turned out. Uh, we both lived in New York City at the time, and we didn't live that far from each other. So uh, I met him uh, a, a few hours after we had met later that night, because you don't go to sleep when you're at the Cannes Film Festival. I mean, you literally, it's an all-night affair. And there's parties, and all the different companies are doing parties, and you just hit all the stuff. It's, it's insane. So I ran into him again, and uh, we ended up just hanging out the whole evening, and he gave me the script, and uh, we ended up, you know, going to baseball games in New York, and because we lived not too far away, and and uh, the rest was history. So, is the flapjacks line the one that people throw in your face uh, every time you meet them? Yeah, I know. <laughs> while Bill Etzcorn has made several flapjack jokes <laughs> in constantly every time he sees you, and he's seen you. Oh, I, yes, you have. Always a goddamn flapjack joke. <laughs> so yeah, so that's the one line. And uh, both of you guys, does that bother you when people like, or does that flatter you? I love it. Yeah. I think it's great because you don't get sick of hearing that. No, of course not. I would get sick of it. Well, no, you wouldn't. No, I wouldn't. You know, actors no, are so sweet. egoistic. Like, of course, we love. Them. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, I mean, yeah. It's, it's really cool that you know that people have, have like the film so much. You know? Right. Now, when when did you start acting? I did my first, well, I did theater when I was a kid. Yeah. Our whole family did. But um, the first thing, I got my SAG card when I was, I did a, 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 a national uh, McDonald's commercial. And, uh, As a little kid? No, I was a teenager. Okay. In the 70s. So what did you have to do in the McDonald's commercial in the 70s? What, what did they make you do back then? It was, uh, I said. What was hip? No, it was, it was something that they were doing, like a sweepstakes or something. I, it, my first line on camera was, uh, I think it was 10, what, I, I forget the, even the line. It was yeah. like, but are you, it was yeah, some crazy thing. Like, you have to 10 eat ways them? to play, you know? Oh, oh, God. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, yeah, it was really, well, <laughs> most commercials are. Yeah, I know, they are. But the director was huge. He, was, uh, he, did, he directed something called, a movie called Fl uh, Flesh Garden, Gordon, or Flash Gordon. Fle yeah, Flesh Gordon was a different genre. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah no. I, I turned that one down. Yeah. I just, the like, Gordon. okay, kid, now... Drop your pants and say it again. <laughs> you jackass. No, All right. The directed the, yeah. Flash Gordon. I'm like, oh my god, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get to like do this for a real movie director. <laughs> Woo. Right. Well, so, Flash Gordon was a big movie. Yeah, it was. Yeah. 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 I think you're the line that probably you probably don't realize it, but I think the line that people most quote to you. Yes, sir. Yeah. Is that one? Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. Enough. I just love playing yeah. that for you. Thanks. Yes, yeah, so a lot. Yes, sir. Yeah. Now we, we, we joke about we joke about that often, but uh, and you say maybe I was a little overzealous. I think it was a little over the top myself. <laughs> yeah. 
But he was an ex- he was excited. You were trying to show he was excited. Why? What was your thinking there? Because oh, okay, I, because the character was always wanting to get out there and and fight, and Lee would never let him. You know, and was really protected him because he was important. Yeah, I mean uh, to Lee. We said no, mate. So Taylor, you're my baby he, boy. Anytime he was given anything to do that is, was the least bit dangerous, he just was like, oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> man, like, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> oh, oh, you know, like, yes, sir. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so he'd be sitting there going, oh, Lord. <laughs> there is no time. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, okay. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a break. We're going to come back. Uh, I think we've got the game next. I don't know what's next, but we're going to take a quick break, come back, and uh, get to the game. So uh, stick around. We'll be right back. Yeah. Oh, uh, you guys are the best. Thank you. If you're a lover of history, then go to trhistorical.com. There you'll find apparel, decor, and gear, and our listeners will receive 10% off plus free shipping within the U.S. if you use promo code GBERG1863 at checkout. So take advantage of this deal at trhistorical.com. TR Historical, for the love of history. You're listening to the Addressing Gettysburg podcast with Matt Callery. It's time for everybody's favorite game show. Whose line is it anyway? But you have to name the person he's saying it to. And now here's your host, me. Okay. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you and welcome to Whose Line Is Anyway, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we've got our contestants today. We've got Barbara. Barbara, hello. Barbara, yes. I'm oh, sorry, Barbara. Hello. Uh, Michael, I mean, uh, what's your name? Cameron. Eric. God damn it. Jesus. Eric, if you don't mind putting the microphone in front of the person I'm talking to. There you go. All right. What's Bauer? I just was going to say, he's a boy, she's a girl. You should try that again. <laughs> Get the names right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, well, I wish you had name tags. Uh, the next one, of course, everybody. <laughs> say a big round of applause for Barbara. <laughs> next one is uh, Cameron Mallow. Everybody knows Cam. Hello, Cam. <laughs> Cam, uh, are you nervous? Do you think you're going to do well? You know the movie that well, or what? I know it in my sleep. <laughs> oh. oh, in his sleep. Oh, be careful. Oh. Be careful. Yeah, exactly. Those are fighting words, ladies. Better be careful. And we got Beth. Beth, hello. Hi. How are you? Good. I'm fine. And how how well do you think you'll do? I think Cam's going to win. You think Cam's going to win? How about you, Barbara? Do you think Cam's going to win? You think Cam's going to win? How how good are you at uh, this movie? I'm. I'm I'm usually pretty pretty good with this All stuff, right. but I don't know. I haven't watched this movie as many times as you have. Uh, well, no. <laughs> no, I don't think has. anybody's watched it as much as Tim has. <laughs> <laughs> Not even you, Cameron. <laughs> <laughs> Not even Ron Maxwell. <laughs> yeah, you're on. Oh, I, I was going to say to Cam, I was watching a movie before you were born. <laughs> <laughs> I was born in 91, so I remember when it came out. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> How could you remember when it came out? It Tim's came definitely out. watched were, this more were, than you, you were have. Two. You, you were, were two. two years old? <laughs> you remember. Yeah. You remember as a, t- as a three-year-old or a yeah, two-year-old. three-year-old. Sitting yeah. in a movie theater for four hours. <laughs> no, it was on TNT. <laughs> <laughs> you were 13. <laughs> your mother would set you up in front of the TV every day and yeah. run the movie, right? That was your no, barn. It was a Sunday afternoon when I first saw it. <laughs> you remember the day? Yeah. What what season was it in? Every season. <laughs> <laughs> it was spring. I, I watched it every Sunday. <laughs> this boy needs help. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> All right, let's get on with this. Jeez. All right. Uh, so first one, we're going to start with Barbara. First one, Barbara. Who is this guy? Say, who is this guy and who is he saying it to? Ready? Colonel Chamberlain to you. Did you hear it? No. Sorry. That's why I'm not used to the damn board, folks. Here we go. Colonel Chamberlain to you. Jeff Daniels. Yes. And he is saying it to... The uh, the man who is the head of the um, main soldiers that wanted to stop fighting. Awesome. Oh, Almost the, the, that's so close. It's so close. 118th. I bet I bet 
bah, bah, bah. <laughs> dock a point from Cam. Yeah, I'm going to dock five from Cam. By the way, you can't steal, but Cam, if you want to answer, you can't get a point, but go ahead. Captain Brewer, 118th Pennsylvania. <laughs> yes, that is correct. Very good. You get a Dan Butterfield for that. Dan, Dan, Dan Butterfield, Butterfield, Butterfield. All right, so that's uh, no points anywhere. Okay, Cam, this is your question here. Ready? Every man here knows his duty. Brigadier General Armistead talking to the French Im- uh, ambassador. Oh, oh negative. British, British oh, God. I, I know this in my sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Wake me up at 3 a.m. I'll tell he you who it is. He has a name, Cameron. <laughs> I, can't, I have, I'm not, I have trouble with the name. His coat's right there. <laughs> it wasn't French. It was yes, British. it was Observer. Oh, All right. <laughs> Moving on. Moving on to Beth. Beth, this is yours. Good luck. They don't even need guns to defend that. All they need to do is roll rocks down on you. General Hood to General Longstreet. There you go. Very good. Hey. You get a point. Dan, Points on the board. Dan, but a feel, but a feel, but a feel. Finally got a point. Okay. Uh, moving on now to Barbara. Barbara, this is your second one. That bloody damn hill as bare as his bloody damn hair. He's not talking about me. Uh, play that again. That bloody damn hill as bare as his bloody damn hair. Oh, General Yule talking to General Lee. Mm. Oh. Half right. Oh, that's right. It wasn't good. All right, oh, go ahead. Beth wants to steal it, but you no stealing. General Trimble to General Lee. That's correct. Uh, General Trimble to General Lee. Sorry, though. No points awarded. Okay. Nobody's going to the attic. Uh, <laughs> okay. Cameron, here we go. Yeah, I know. They still talk about your grades there with reverence and awe. <laughs> what is he? That's General Longstreet to the British Observer. That. <laughs> You're supposed to know this in your sleep. Come on. I can't get the name out. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, Barbara. Do you want to? You want to? It's uh. Do play it again. Okay. Here we go. Yeah, I know. They still talk about your grades there with reverence and awe. General Longstreet. Yep. To. Oh, the guy that wrote Say the book. Say his acting name. Yep, the guy that wrote the book. That's right. Uh, that, uh, that's good? Okay, nope, 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 nope. Well, you got to give his the name. The guy that wrote the book. Um, he was a Confederate. Yeah. <laughs> no, he wasn't. He wore French perfume. Oh, I know. No, that's, no, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> he was in that scene, but it wasn't him. All right, I got to give it to you because we got time. I it, say it was Longstreet to pick it. Nope. No. So, it Pettigrew. Was, Pettigrew. Pettigrew. Who is it? It's Pettigrew, right. Okay, Pettigrew. Let me, so. let me on for just a second. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, let me mention that this is one of the clues oh. in the puzzle that I put on your table. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh. The guy played James Bond. That's right. Okay. George Laserby. Who, who is the last? Oh, it's Beth's turn, it's right? Cameron. It's Cameron. All right, Beth, here we go. We are never quite prepared for so many to die. Oh, we do expect the occasional empty chair. Long, uh, lead to Longstreet. Very good. Very good. Lead to Longstreet. Man. Dan, Dan, Dan. Butterfield, Butterfield, Butterfield. You're the only one with points. <laughs> 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 I got buzzer boy. <laughs> buzzer boy. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're moving on now to Barbara. Last one, Barbara. Okay. Last one. Last chance to get one point. Please, God. <laughs> you call yourselves Americans, but you're really just transplanted Englishmen. Oh yes. Yeah. That is um. Yes. Uh, the him, French. Him. Yeah. Um, the English observer. <laughs> Um, to General Longstreet. Now I just have to think of the Englishman's <laughs> name. Oh, um, oh, God. Oh. It's, uh, I'm, I'm losing. Oh, really? Oh, oh Barbara. Don't I get any points for the accent? Wait, what? Is it, what? Because she got an accent? I got to give her a point? What? what, what yeah. <laughs> 
That's fair. I'm, a, I'm fine. Fine. What a weird group of people. Freemantle. Arthur Freeman. I'm looking at his picture. <laughs> there you go. That's his All right, Freeman. All right, very good. Now, next one, Cameron. This is your last one. Last chance to get one point as well, you disappointment. Here we go. How are you? You're looking kind of peaky. Tom Chamberlain to Lawrence Chamberlain. There you go! Cameron is on the board. Damn, damn, damn. But a feel, but a feel, but a feel. Beth, it's up to you now. Can you hold the title with two points? She doesn't lose a point. Why would she lose a point? Cameron, sit down. All right, here we go. This isn't your game. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Here we go. Now we'll see how professors fight. Um, Chamberlain to, um, 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 yep, yep, yep. oh my god, I can't think of his name. Oh man. The, 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 the Harvard Yard, oh my god. No father than Harvard Yard. <laughs> I can't think of it. I can't think of his name. Wow. Wow. Colonel Vincent. Colonel Vincent, that's correct. So it's actually Colonel Vincent too long. Two cha- two long sh- chamber. Yeah, long. Sh- Jesus. <laughs> All we're all screwed up. Screwed and we're, and we're not even drinking. That's the worst part. Okay. Do you want... I got three more. These were supposed to be tiebreakers if we had a tie, because I honestly thought those were easy. Do you want to just try them? Let's see. All right. Uh, raise your hand. Just shout out your name. And then Eric put the mic to them once they shout out their name. Who is this person speaking to? I never knew you were such a cavalier. Cameron, you have to shout your name, too. Gen- uh... Uh, it was uh, Buford to uh, gim- uh, Gambler. Oh, no. <laughs> ah, no. No, it wasn't. Barbara Go. Buford to Devon. That's correct. <laughs> damn, damn, damn. But a feel, but a feel, but a feel. I'm going to give you that point. All right, here we go. Last one. Oh, I sure don't mean to imply you, sir. No, hell no, sir. That's a tough one. one Give it again. One? Oh, I sure don't mean to imply you, sir. No, hell no, sir. This is easy. Well, you're oh. smarter than most people. <laughs> <laughs> Cameron raises... You gotta yell your name, Cam. Go ahead. I think it's uh, General Pickett when he's talking to Longstreet. Very good, hey. Cameron. Yeah. Damn, damn, damn. But a feel, but right. a feel, but a feel. Well, great. Now, because we had to give Barb a point for half an answer, we have a complete tie, and I went through all my tiebreakers. But (laughs) (laughs) I'm just kidding. Those tiebreakers were for fun anyway. Beth is the winner, so Beth gets to go in the attic with Tim. Yay. And you guys, hold on. Has Tim's have... wife signed up on this <laughs> the attic? <laughs> no, it's just, just Beth and Tim. I have here, I have a gift for you. It's a signed copy of Brothers of War, the Iron Brigade of Gettysburg, uh, a novel by Mike Eisenhut right over there at that table. Also, also, you get to cho- I have a bunch of shirts here, different sizes. You get to choose one of these shirts from our buddy Mike Stretch over at the Heritage one Depot. Cameron. One. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you guys for doing all that. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, everybody. All right, we're back. Well, you can pick them out later, guys. You don't have to All right, so we're back here uh, with, the, uh, with the actors uh, from the film, and we're going to talk about now the Farnsworth house during the shooting of the film. So we're going to bring in a guest. Tim's going to take this over, but uh, Bo and Patrick join in uh, with him. Tim, if you want to just sit here, you could do that if you like. Okay. Uh, we got to find Lauren. Yeah, Loring. We're going to ask. So, Loring, explain who Loring is and, and why we're having him on right now. Where'd he go? Hey, okay. is he here? Went home. <laughs> he went home. All right. So now we're going to bring uh, Wild Bill Etzhorn up here. Okay. So um, we're going to, in a minute here, hopefully, we'll uh, bring Loring on. I saw him a few minutes ago. Of course, uh, Loring Schultz is the owner of the Farnsworth House. And, uh, you know, he opened... He opened the Farnsworth House in 1972. So not only does this year mark the 30th anniversary of the making of the movie, 
This is also the 50th anniversary of the Farnsworth House restaurant in Gettysburg. That's, that's, a, that's a good long time, right? Yeah. And, you know, I was thinking about this. I was thinking about this recently. Uh, here comes Lauren. I was thinking about this recently, and as far as I could determine, okay. there is only one other restaurant in Gettysburg that's been owned by the same family that has been in business longer than the Farnsworth House. Ernie's Texas Lunch. And of course, it's er owned by Ernie, and his father owned it, and his granddad owned it. So uh, since the early 20s, depending on, I guess, how you count. Um, and uh, that's saying something, you know. So I think uh, um, there's no question that uh, Loring is a very successful businessman. Now, of course, we are here to discuss some of the events that occurred uh, during the movie with Lauren. So let me just give a, a little setup before we ask you some questions. Uh, as already mentioned, it was in the summer and the fall of 1992, and the Farnsworth House became the unofficial headquarters for the actors and crew during the making of the movie. And undoubtedly, this was largely due to Loring's hospitality towards the actors and the crew. Um, a lot of people probably are unaware of this, but at some point during the filming, uh, Loring decided to close the tavern down to the general public on Friday and Saturday nights, and only cast and crew were allowed to enter the tavern. He created sort of a sanctuary where the actors were free to relax and socialize in private without constant harassment uh, from the fans searching for pictures and autographs. And the actors appreciated this. Um, and because of this, Loring found, uh, you know, forged a friendship with many of the actors. Uh, for instance, I remember Tom Berenger, um, he was a frequent visitor to the tavern for several years after the filming. And he was always excited when he came in to talk to everybody and tell us about his latest project. I had a long discussion with him about the Battle of San Juan Hill uh, prior to the making of Rough Riders, which, of course, he was one of the producers of that uh, film. And as I remember, Sam Elliott and uh, Patrick Gorman uh, were also in that movie. Uh, Patrick played uh, the colonel of the 71st New York in the, uh, fighting at San Juan Hill, which, by the way, is a very good and very unappreciated movie if you have not seen it. Rough Riders. Yes. But I got to tell you, um, uh, you come here on any given night and there are people sitting here at the bar watching the movie and enjoying it. So having discussed all this, at some point... Loring acquired some of the uniforms and props from the movie, and he put them on display, and he hooked up a VHS player. It wasn't a DVD player at first. And he had a monitor, and he began to show the movie 24-7. <laughs> and I remember saying to myself at the time that, you know, this is just a little fad, and it can't last very long. <laughs> but people come to Gettysburg. They see the movie. They sit at the bar. They watch the movie. They expect it to be playing here when they return for a visit. And they love it. And the Farnsworth House has become sort of a memorial or a shrine to the movie Gettysburg. And I just have to say that I would never have suspected that this would be so successful. And, you know, I think Loring is a genius. So... I wanted to ask him a, a, few, a few questions because, you know, um, oftentimes the actors are interviewed about the movie or, uh, you know, historians do blog posts about the, mo the movie or bloggers do blog posts about the movie on YouTube. But I, I don't know if uh, Loring has been interviewed uh, about the movie. So I'd like to ask you a few questions. Um, one of them is, uh, how did it come to be that you were the unofficial headquarters of the movie? Tom Berenger gave that the uh, right. Yeah. yeah. Tom Berenger declared that. 
So you know, he went along with it. Then. Friday nights. Oh. Right. To the Confederates. Oh, and you know, that's interesting that you say that. I do, I did not remember that, but Friday nights for the Confederates and Saturday night for some of the Union actors somebody or somebody else. <laughs> because I do remember on back-to-back -back nights, um, Tom Berenger hosting the party, and then the next night, Sam Elliott hosting a party here. So that was Friday. That's interesting. Friday and Saturday nights. And you may not realize it, but we do have a poster with the actors that played the union roles over there on the wall between the columns. And uh, the actors that played the Confederate roles are actually back there underneath the case in the back of the Farnsworth House room. Uh, and at the end of the filming, they signed that and they're still hanging here. Yep. Um, right. Uh, I remember a great story that you told me that, um, Loring, that uh, when they were, at some point, when you're in production, uh, I guess it was Ron Maxwell that came in here and saw you had an original 1858 Adams County wall map on your wall, and they needed a map so that Robert E. Lee could say, you know, what's the name of that town? I don't have my spectacles. Yeah. And that is Loring's map in that scene. I was in that scene and didn't know that. Yeah. We're good. So there, are, there are actually three maps were used. Uh, I supplied them with two of them, and they made up one of their own and used it. And then when they brought my maps back, they said, uh, look, we made the third map. We're going to let you have that because oh. you didn't charge us anything for using yours. So we're going to give you the third map. And I remember... So there was three maps used. Two of the maps I remember. I remember your 1850 wall map, and then there's, a, there's the map where you're um, at the Slider House yeah. with... Um, I, I remember uh, you're in that scene, and of course, Keith is in that scene with the bandage on his head, you know, because he got wounded the first day, and there's a map on the table that they're using, and that's one of the maps. Um uh, it did, um, everybody asked us this. Everybody asked me this. I'm sure you've been asked it a bunch of times. But when did you decide to buy the props from the movie and put a t case together with all the movie props? And how did that come about? Well, the props lady used to hang out in here. Okay. So one day, she it was getting near the, the uh, end of the shoot. And uh, I told her, I think her name was Edith, I remember. I said, Edith, when they start bringing that stuff in, will you let me know? She said, Yeah. So I got a call about 9 o'clock one morning. She said, they're bringing it in, Lauren. Come on out. I said, okay. So I went out about 9 o'clock, and uh, I started gathering this stuff up and putting it in the middle of the floor. And she said, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. She said, I don't, I don't have time for this. Said, Look, pick out what you want, and then we'll price it later. So about 9 o'clock at, at night, we were ready. And we had it all, we had it all in the line, right? And uh, she'd pick up something, she'd say, 20 bucks. And I'd say, okay. And then I'd pick something, something else, and she'd say, 50. I said, oh, all right, 30. So that's <laughs> the way it went, okay, until we got the end. But she also told me to bring cash. Okay. <laughs> so I, I thought I was I thought I was there with the cash. And uh, at the end of the thing, she says, uh, you owe me this much. You know, you go going through my wallet, and I, I come up about 150 short. She said, I can't believe you. She said, I give you all these deals and this relic, and you can't have enough money to pay me. She said, that's all right. You can have it. Okay. So that's, <laughs> so that's how we got it. Okay. And um, we get this other, this another oh, question. One other thing I want to go tell ahead. you. There's a horse's leg back there in the corner. Can you all see it there? No. Uh, on the bottom. A horse's leg? A horse's leg, I, I, yeah. I don't think they knew they, they were sitting behind oh, the horse's are eating. leg. <laughs> you guys are eating right by the horse's leg. <laughs> Where is that? So I said to her, I said, uh, those horses you had on the field, I said, like, buy one of them. Oh. She said, what are you talking about? She said, I can't sell you one of them. They go back into storage in L.A. I said, oh, well, man. I, said, I kept after. She said, all right, I'll sell you a leg. So, <laughs> so that's how we got the leg. Not very appetizing, but anyway. And uh, Lauren was telling me the other day that all the items in the case are from the movie. So there's nothing added in between there. That's all from the movie. I have a question, including Tim. some of the flags. Uh, uh, Lauren, there's that third core flag there. Does anybody remember seeing a third core flag in the movie at all? 
No, Cam, you would know this because you know everything about the movie. <laughs> but, <laughs> but no, so, so do you do you know where that third court? What? At the headquarters. That's, That's what we were saying said, before, yeah. Ted. Okay, so we got it right. We got it before you said it, so don't worry. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Oh, oh, so um, I noticed that uh, you're, you know, you're constantly adding to your collection of material here. So if anybody has some rare items from the movie Gettysburg, they would like to donate to the Farnsworth House collection. You're welcome to. So, but, you know, just recently, um, I say recently, within the last few years, you acquired uh, the jacket uh, worn by uh, Colonel Fremantle that we it was it was the star of the quotes uh, quiz, but um, we uh, how did that come about? Just recently you got that. Well, he was a, a customer here in the bar. He's from Bel Air, Maryland. Oh, and uh, I got to know him talking to him. He said he had Fremantle's coat. I said, Oh man, that's nice. He said, I got his hat too. I said, Oh damn, that's nice. Hat. So one day he walks in. He says, Lauren, he says, uh, if you display this, he says I'll give it to you. That's, That's awesome. Okay. So and we made the case and put it on the wall. That's pretty cool. But hey, speaking yeah. of, of that, uh, Patrick, you're wearing the vest that they made for you for the film, right? Under your vest. Right. <laughs> this, this is it. I never wore it. It was made for Hood. But, you know, I, all the scenes I was in was my full coat. And you know how hot it was. Oh, yes. Yeah, you got to just put that to your mouth. <laughs> no. Is it on there? Yeah, yeah, yes. you got so it. So it was too hot to wear, so I never wore it. It's the only part of, the only things I was kept, allowed to keep after the film was the spurs I was wearing and this vest, but it, and the sword, of course, which was a gift. Right. But You're this, not getting rid of that. This was never, never in the film, but it was made for... So you mentioned the Spurs, and the guy who has the Spurs is sitting right over here, John John Pinkerton, yes. who is related to the famous Pinkerton agency Pinkertons, right, John? Right. Yeah. Right. And uh, so he's got a lot of uh, memorabilia from the movie oh, in his yeah, basement, yeah. and my friend Donnie and I are plotting a way to break into his house and steal it. <laughs> but he says that he's got security, but we'll get around that. But anyway, so maybe someday, uh, John John, you would like to put some stuff in here. <laughs> no, he loves his stuff you would never do that back to you tim so um it, it is fascinating that there you know the the place where the movie is shown on a regular basis now obviously we're not showing it tonight but constantly and then the items from the movie are on display and you know i i don't know of too many more movies that have a place where the stuff resides i know there's other places like if you go to um, Mystic Seaport, you know, right. Mystic Pizza, you go to the pizza place. and True Grit, like the, where they where yeah. they shot the original True Grit out yeah. in Colorado, there's stuff there. It's, it's fascinating, you know, that people come here, and, and I gotta tell you, though, most of the visitors who are not familiar with the movie come in here, and they look at the wall, and they have no idea that they're not real, right. that they think these are actual things from the movie. So, I always try to be clear and say things like, Oh, yes. This is the uniform worn by Robert E. Lee, as portrayed by Martin Sheen in the movie Gettysburg. <laughs> People love that. And of course, Stephen Lang's uniform, you know, is really neat. Now, yeah. you mentioned Fremantle. We have um, uh, the Fremantle jacket and a Fremantle hat over here. But then also in the case is another Fremantle hat. And I did notice in the movie there's two different hats worn by Fremantle at different times. And both of them are here in the collection. Now, I should also mention this because... Obviously, uh, you know, the filming in the movie Gettysburg was just a, uh, you know, in 1992, um, from beginning to end and the different phases of the filming, there were more than one phase of the filming. It might have covered a span of like four or five months from beginning to end. Uh, but Loring has been here for 50 years and lots of people who are well known have been entertained at the Farnsworth House over the years, uh, like Mamie Eisenhower, for instance, and um, uh, Stacy Keach, uh, mm. of course, who was a star in um, the, the Blue and the Gray. gray. Not oh. to be confused with the North and the South. Right, right. But, uh, or North and South. Stacy Keach did a documentary on the Battle of Gettysburg. If you haven't seen it, it's just an excellent documentary. But he stayed here and he ate here. And so um, uh, I was going to ask you, Loring, uh, who are some of the people that come to mind, other people that uh, we might, people might think are famous that have, uh, you've entertained here? We've had the uh, chief of staffs here a number of times. Uh, Art Linklater. Yeah. Oh, Steven Spielberg. 
yeah. was here. Yeah, he was here. <laughs> <laughs> and, wow. Um, uh, the actor, uh, um, Matt Callery. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. No, um, uh, they played Lincoln. Uh, oh, Daniel Day Lewis. Yeah, Daniel Day. Wow, he was here. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Okay. So. Right. We, oh, go ahead. Oh no, 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 no! I thought I thought you were done. Okay. Okay. Oh, you, you have, have, any, for have any other more questions for him? No. Uh, no, I asked the question <laughs> that I had. <laughs> I'm all set. But uh, Lori, if you want to hang around, I don't know if you want to go or anything. But if you want to hang around, we're going to take questions from the audience in a little bit. So you're welcome to stay if they might have a question for you. Well. Well, you don't past, have to. It's past my bedtime. They have okay. A, <laughs> good. Has, I understand. A question back here. Uh, you got a question for Lori? Go ahead. No, no, no. Ask it now. He's going to bed. Just yell it out. I'll, I'll relay it. No. During, during the filming, uh, the rumor is that you helped uh, feed and water the horses. You helped feed and water the horses during filming. Is that true? No. No, I never had any. It's a bold faced lie. No. Okay. All now, right. but the horse's leg, <laughs> to give you some idea how old that is, Edith told me it goes back to Rio Bravo. Oh, wow. wow. Oh, that's, that's cool, awesome. though. My favorites. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, me too. Now, um, we should mention, since you know, somebody brought up the horses, you know what interesting, in a, in a movie of this type, when they're filming it, um, one of the groups of people that came into the Farnsworth house that was here at um, the parties every weekend was the uh, rustlers or the handlers, the wranglers, the wranglers. wranglers, the people Doug. in charge of the horses. So, you know, they have lots of horses in their chute. All the staff officers are on horseback. You know, these guys rode horses, uh, you know, the officers. And there had to be lots of horses around the set. And so what happens is, you know, they don't take the horses back to the hotel with them at night or anything like that. Just a group of people that's in charge of the horses and every day they bring out the required number of horses for all the different actors and they try to make sure the actor gets the horse that you know is comfortable with them and it's a very difficult job and um, at the time of the filming the the um, bar uh, tender here her name was Max and um, she's a very good friend of mine and she she worked here and she became very good friends with the Wranglers and after the movie was over she left with the Wranglers. <laughs> Do you remember that? And and I haven't. I don't know if I've seen her since. Yeah, no. Get a postcard from her once in a while, but she would, <laughs> you know was really really into the uh, the horses that we used in the movie. <laughs> that seems Is to happen going a lot. Somewhere we no, that was it. That wasn't going anywhere. <laughs> you know the, the movie the movie Gettysburg was a lot like Woodstock <laughs> because. There were several divorces and several marriages that happened during that time in our crew and, and actors and stuff. And, and I'm sure there are a few babies were born as well. But, uh, you know, how how uh, how many months did it take to shoot? Uh, about three. It was about three or three and a half because I was here for rehearsals uh, two weeks before or three weeks before uh, we started shooting. Yeah. So and I think it was May or June, I forget. But and and I and I got home September like twenty seventh. So I was I was gone from May until September twenty seventh. And and there was still I remember, you know, there was still a lot of union stuff to be done. So yeah. I think they didn't wrap until October. That's what know? I've heard. Yeah, yeah. long yeah. time. Long time. So real quick, Bo, your most uh, vivid memory of shooting was what? I was hung over most of the time. I, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> it was headaches. Because of this place right here. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah, we were young and crazy. Uh, the, the, I guess, you know, Pickett's Charge just was so amazing. You got a lump in your throat watching it. It, it was just amazing to watch. Um, I, I think at that time there had never been that many people on that battleground since the actual event. You know, and I, I don't believe that. Well, that's what I was yeah. told. I don't. Tim, Tim. ninety-two. Uh, Tim, you could probably answer that question. Yeah, I don't How many people came for the no, Marine was reenactment? Was there ever a reenactment? There <laughs> well, there, well, we have reunions, like forty thousand people in the field of pickets charge during nineteen thirteen. Oh, that's right. <laughs> It's all right. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So maybe nobody that one looks thing, like soldiers. Yeah. Have been and, on and, that field. and here's one thing I do remember. No. Speaking of the most. 
uh, the bombardment preceding Pickett's Charge, where they lined up the cannons and they fired the cannons, that was the most amount of actual Civil War cannons used in a movie. Right. You know, there you go. And so think wait, about that, because they don't, a lot of times they're just... If, or they use a few and then they throw in some today CGI. Right. So right. that was yeah. probably. They do plate shots now. But back yeah. then, we really had everybody on the field. But it, it, Pickett's Charge, you know, I mean, in 1913, there was a bunch of old guys that crippled up to yeah. the wall and shook hands. Yeah. But I mean, we had 10,000 yeah. people in the field yeah. at Pickett's Charge. You know, with with stuff going off. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I, yeah, that, I, that's what I told. There was more people in that field. I mean, yeah, or as many a lot of people. As it was probably like the second before. or third coolest thing to happen there since the battle, which wasn't particularly. You know, cool. one thing that I don't think a lot of people realize is we we just talked about you know how long it took to film the movie, and I remember there were different phases. Like maybe they had all the Confederate reenactors here, then all the Union reenactors here, and or re, uh, actors, and then they did scenes together. It was only two weeks that they had thousands of reenactors. They, there were two weeks where they brought in all these reenactors and they filmed the scenes with a lot of people in them. But for most of the filming, there wasn't a lot of people. It was, you know, scenes where you were just the campfire scenes or yeah. was, scenes that you were filming of the what, small group of people. Or what they did was they got everybody. They arranged to take get their two weeks off vacation. All the reenactors, mm. so that uh, there would yeah, be yeah, yeah. all these people here. Uh, that makes sense. So they took their vacation time and did. It, yeah. yeah. How, how about you, Patrick? Your most vivid memory from the shooting of Gettysburg? You know, this this is uh, sacrilegious almost in a way. Cause I loved all the all the scenes I worked in, but I had an experience where, since I said I told you I was there early, and I grew up riding horses, right? I knew how to ride, and it's the famous thing when you ask actors when they're cast, "Can you ride a horse?" Everybody says yes. Right. So even so, I start, went out and got my horse. I picked a horse who, by the way, had done more movies than I had. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not, not kidding. It was a great horse, but I had to wear boots and spurs and wear a saber, and I'd never really done that before. So I said, I gotta go practice. And I will admit that I did a couple times fall on my ass and my horse waited <laughs> for me to get up. Right. So I went out and practiced. The first day we had all the cast come out where they were going to be assigned their horses and they were going to ride. And the, it was on a hilly kind of area with the grass was wet. So I get on my horse and I'm trotting out there and everybody's on their horses and trying to get on their horses. And I'm trotting along and my horse's feet slipped on the grass completely out from under him like this. and. I, being the athletic being that I am, <laughs> just threw my leg over his head, landed right side of him, held the reins while he struggled, and he got up, and I took a few, we, this is all in one take, they were turning the camera, and then I leaped on from the wrong side of the horse and galloped on. And of course, everybody saw this, <laughs> and they were going, oh shit. And, I kept, the, there were half the actors who'd never been on a horse or were, or, or were scared to death and kept coming up to me, can you give me, uh, or coach me how, and you know, I'm not an expert, but I just practice well. I will always remember that because I was saying, where is the damn camera when you have this great <laughs> right stunt? In. I mean, it was like imperfection all in a breath. Leg over, trot, 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 <laughs> leg on, and here we go again. No, so that was my favorite moment. I hate to say wow. that was. Now that would be mine if I were you. Yeah. I'm going to give you one more. Okay. Everybody's heard this. We are on the late filming, and they wanted to film. They didn't have any pictures of Hood in battle, and then we were going to get some battle scenes. And it was late in the day. We were filming a scene with Lee and and Longstreet and. And Ron said, well, you know, we got to load the horses onto the trailers because the, the, they won't allow us to ride. And I said to Ron, because I knew the terrain, I'd been, I said, well, listen, if we go back through these woods on horseback, we can be there in 15 minutes. Yeah. And he said, well, you can do that? And I said, yeah, because I was very smart. I chose as my staff all the wranglers. They were guys who knew how to ride. So we take off. 
through those dark woods at the bottom with all the, the fences and everything. And we're really booking it there because we, we were fighting for the sun. Right. And I want to be in a battle scene in the movie. Come on. <laughs> I'm an actor. I want to get in front of the camera. Right. So we're galloping through and we break through the woods, the, the back road up to the Devil's down Day. the road comes a whole group of Asian tourists <laughs> mixed with some Caucasian people who as we came through the woods and we were galloping we broke through the, it's like the ghosts of the Confederacy <laughs> and there were people who were not Asian but the Asians also were there. the faces like turned white they yeah. thought the ghosts are real <laughs> and we didn't slow down I remember going past and saluting as we and we went up and, I, and I'm sure those people still tell that story to this yeah <laughs> because I just told it again <laughs> the, you know the um, we mentioned earlier about your scene where um, uh, General Hood is talking to General Longstreet and saying you know we can't attack that hill they're gonna roll rocks down on us that scene was filmed at near the site where that conversation would have taken place. Most of the movie was filmed on the set near Gettysburg, but not on the actual battlefield. But there were a few scenes that were filmed at the actual location. Yeah, we had the, and that was one of them. The, the, the round farm. tops were right behind us. Yeah, they, um, I wanted yeah. to add some about the horses because it was pretty funny. Okay. okay. Literally every actor, and, and you're never going to find an actor that will tell the director, oh, no, I, I don't know how to ride. Right. They all, uh, oh, oh, yes, sir, yes, I know, oh, yeah, oh, I grew up on a horse. Yeah. <laughs> Great, you got the part, kid, you know. So uh, when I got out here for rehearsal and stuff, even Ron came to me and says, man, these people don't know how to ride a horse, none of them, you know. And so I had horses, so um, I, I met with Doug, and, and we rode a little bit, and they checked me out. And so I ended up helping Doug help some of the actors learn to ride, and uh uh, Joyce Applegate, that was the funniest part. Uh, he, he he had a really hard time on the horse. And God rest his soul, he, he's played passed Kemper. a long time ago. Yeah, played Kemper. And so, um, and he's a pretty big old boy. And uh, some, somebody didn't tighten the saddle very well. Uh -oh. He's on film, and he's riding. And all of a sudden, you see him just, uh, you know, start slanting this way and this way. And he didn't want to, you know, he didn't want to break character. So here he is like this. And then finally, the, the saddle just goes and he tumbles under the horse and, you know, rolls. And uh, he was fine. He wasn't hurt. Put he wasn't hurt. Yeah, but, uh, yeah so, so we had a lot of that. We had a lot of... Uh, a lot of actors that were there's, there's that had blooper, no clue how to, how to ride. There's that blooper reel that has been making the rounds on the uh, internet, and there's uh, I think a scene where Tom Berenger wipes out off his yes. horse. Yes, yeah. I was I remember when Tom yeah. wiped out. Yeah, yeah. And, and what's funny somebody, is somebody had a trick horse, uh, not a trick, but uh, a fall horse, and if you hit them just right on the neck, they go down like that. <laughs> And we had a guy, we were all talking, we're in a circle on this hill, and we're all talking, and, and uh, I forget the guy, but he was laughing, and he went, ha, 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 and he slaps the horse, and the horse just goes, bam! <laughs> Man, he was like, white as a sheet, his eyes as he was going down, you know, oh! You know, the horse is on cue. It's Love awesome. horses. All right. Well, thank you, Lauren, for coming up. Yeah. Th thank you, Tim, for uh, taking care of all that. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back. What do Getty's Bike Tours customers say? Very family friendly. We had a wonderful time with our son. Me and my friends were able to uh, rent these bikes and go at our own pace. So we were able to just do what we wanted to do when we wanted to do it. And I highly recommend it to anybody else. It seemed like the right way to go to view the, the wonderful sights and also get an incredible amount of history from Bob. Our tour guide Bruce was so knowledgeable about the facts and the history of these battlefields that I came away with an understanding uh, that was unmatched by any other means. The breeze on the battlefield made up for the hot day. I had a wonderful time, a uh, great trip, lots of history, um, wonderful bike ride, perfect weather. Could have asked for a nicer day. Uh, highly recommended. Uh, if you're going to tour Gettysburg, I would recommend doing it on the bike. It's a lot of fun. 
I loved it. It was awesome. Um, we really couldn't stump the professor with any of our questions, so uh, we, we thought it was really well worth it. It was an excellent day out and got you outside and experienced the weather. Beautiful weather out here today. We had a lot of fun. If you're thinking about it, I had to say, give it a shot. It was awesome for us. I hope it's awesome for you guys too. Go to gettysbike.com or call 717-752-7752 to book a battlefield experience you will never forget. All free episodes of Addressing Gettysburg are brought to you by our sponsors and our patrons over at patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. To become a sponsor, send an email to matt at addressing Gettysburg.com. And to be a patron, go to patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg today. And we thank you in advance. You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. You're all too easy. Thank you. Uh, okay, so we're back, and it's time, uh, as is our tradition on uh, Ask a Guides, to uh, uh, go to audience questions. This is the first time we actually have the audience with us, and they're going to ask their own questions. So uh, let's get started. You guys ready to take some questions? These are going to be tough ones. <laughs> and we're going to start with um, a man who really needs no introduction. He... Well, his nickname has the word questions in it. It's six questions lengths, and today he has 12. So we're going to start. No, just kidding. We're going to start with six questions lengths. Come on out here so they can see you there, Mikey. There you go. Six questions. In the flesh, folks. All right, Mike Lentz. So thank you very much for being here. This has been really enjoyable. So You're welcome. Uh, my question. What about the actors? <laughs> Uh, my first question is for Mr. Gorman. Uh, what do you think of John Bell Hood? Besides his physical qualities, what aspects of Hood's character do you admire the most? I think what was his passion in, in, in conflict. I mean, he was a very shy, basically a shy person, except in battle. And that was stressed over and over in all the research I did. I respected that about him uh, and his passion, even though he wasn't the greatest strategician or tactician, uh, and he, there was criticism of that. He was probably, should have never been uh, leading a corps, but uh, I respected him and, and, his, uh, and his being. He was a shy person, but very loyal. Hmm. And uh, th that's basically it for me. For <laughs> well, thank you so much. And Mr. Brinkman, I have a question for you. Colonel uh, Walter Taylor, uh, what aspects of Walter Taylor did you find fascinating? And what aspects do you find, do you admire? Well, you know, he, he was a fastidious kind of guy. You know, he was... Uh, he kept the books for the Northern Virginian Army. Uh, he came back here uh, the rest of his life. He had a summer house here, and he actually gave tours on the battlefield, from what I understand. Um, and uh, he knew where all the troop, more than almost anyone, I think, he knew where all the troop movements were, where all the casualties the areas where there were casualties. Am I, am I right, Tim? I mean, he was he was pretty solid. Well, he's um, he is largely responsible, I believe, for the Confederate order of battle that appears in the official reports in the 1880s. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So he so, was. That's impressive. He was like almost a bookkeeper. He was later the tech, uh, the railroad commissioner of Virginia. Um, he, you know, he 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 had a he had a great career after the war as well. You know. Um, yeah, he he uh, he was a little different than everybody in that he was fastidious and he was tightly wound. Actually, interesting. Yeah. Probably a good quality to have in a staff officer. Yeah, yeah. to have that detail oriented. Mm -hmm. Exactly. One thing I wanted to add about Hood was that you know at the end of the war he was married and he had all those children and then they died. the 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 mark of it was that. All the men that had served under him took care of those children. Wow. He was, he, was, he was loved, despite the things that there were said about his behavior in Nashville and those things, which 
I have research were not accurate. Oh, but, okay. Uh, were second-handed, but uh, the, the the signal was that he was beloved by the men that served under him, and that that meant a lot. Really, that's yeah. that's really interesting. I have a question for both of you. Then, uh, reenactors were it seemed were crucial in the filming of the movie. What memories do you have of the reenactors? Well, you, without them, you, there's no film, for one thing. And I think I, I mentioned that earlier. I went out amongst the reenactors and got to know them in character. I was in character, but I became friends and I learned a lot from them. And they're all, they were dedicated, you know, they're, li they're living historians in that group of people. So I, as I said, I got a lot from them and we couldn't have had the film without them for sure. Yeah, no, I uh, same here. I, I got to know some of them. They even showed, oh, you should wear your your thing here like this, and you do. You right. know, they they uh, they hooked me up with the uh, with the when the costumers couldn't. You know. Do you guys still keep in touch with any of them? Mm, we've no one. Uh, it's out a guy out in Virginia. I hear from him every once in a while, but no, you know, thirty years. Yeah. People die. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Oh, okay. Ah. Well, right. face, Facebook yeah. and the internet, inter Instagram, live on, you know? Yeah. I mean, I remember after the film was over, I, I was luckily invited to a lot of these reenactments. And because all the actors were invited, but they were all working. And I wasn't, so I went. But I, I had a lot of fun. But... I'm in touch with a number of them through Facebook and and inter, uh, uh, Instagram. Yeah. So, not I don't always remember them or anything, but I am in touch with them, and, and that's great. Well, that's well and that, thank you. And that's one of the things I think is great about both you guys is that uh, you you're very accessible. You know, people feel like they can talk to you and stuff uh, online and yeah. Facebook, and that's how I met you, uh, yeah. Patrick, originally. Yeah. And Bo, I met you at the uh, uh, reunion that you guys had a few years ago, and uh, I don't know, we, we got along. Well, it, it's, it's fun. I mean, I, I enjoy that because it's, it's, it's authentic. Yeah. You know, right. it's, not, it's not BS. And uh, that's that if you're straight with somebody, then they're straight back, then that's good. It's great to meet your public, you know? Yeah. I, I <laughs> <laughs> All right, enough, enough. Yeah, okay, come on. We, we, go ahead. And you know, you know, Matt, the, the arena actors uh, really, really appreciate the bar here and the movie being played here in the bar. And uh, on, uh, you know, any, any given night in the summer, I'll walk through the bar and uh, there'll be people here and one of them, you know, will point up to the TV that... Oh, there I was. There I am. <laughs> yeah. And you see that all the time. And, they, you know, the th thousands of people were extras in the movie and they come here and they see themselves in the movie 30 years ago. There's one guy named uh, Mark Southern, who is a, a Facebook friend of mine. He comes in here on a regular basis, maybe once every four or five months. And he wears the same uniform that he wore in the movie. <laughs> and uh, I, I, if anybody, you know, uh, is Facebook friends with me, I get his, my picture taken with him under the TV right when his scene comes up. <laughs> <laughs> He's the guy in Pickett's Charge at the very end who jumps up on the stone wall and yells, Fredericksburg! <laughs> Yes. <laughs> but he comes in here all the time, and, and it is it is the people have an emotional connection with the movie. Thousands of people who were the extras in it. Wow. Mm -hmm. There you go. So this, <laughs> this next question is for Mr. Gorman. It goes to a career question, so it's not Gettysburg related. I was looking at the credits there and saw that you were in Avengers Endgame. Mm -hmm. Can you explain what role you played in Avengers Endgame? Oh, God. Awesome. Yeah, well, it's, it's a, a great. I was actually cast. I auditioned for, for playing Old Cap, the, the ending scene of the film. And when I auditioned for it, I got it. It was great. And I showed up in Atlanta to play the scene. It was great first class. And I had my own room. I had my own driver and everything. Oh. I go on the set. Everybody is famous. There's nobody there not famous except me. And I'm going to do the scene. And then the director comes up to me and he says, we've just discovered this new process and we want to try it out on this scene. We're, you play the scene, 
the actor is going to, Chris is going to play a scene, and then we want you to copy his gestures, and then we'll film you doing it, and then we're going to technically blend the two of you. Ah, uh, okay. Wow. And I thought, oh <laughs> shit. <laughs> uh, no one will ever know I'm in. Yeah. It. <laughs> Actually, you know, it made sense. I mean, he's six foot two, and I'm five foot ten. And uh, anyway, it shrunk well, an instance before. But but. but I, I did did the scene, and then I went back to L.A. and they put me in a a metal cage and filmed. No, I didn't have any actor to play it. I played my the scene, and they shot it from every angle. I mean, every angle, up my, you know, and down. <laughs> under, and then I didn't tell anybody really, except few the family and thing, that I was in it because you're not going to see me. You're going to see whatever the. Right. <laughs> The interesting thing was, after it opened, I didn't I didn't see the screening, uh, and a friend of mine called me and he says, "Hey, let's go out for coffee." And by the way, he says, "Did you see Avengers Endgame?" And I said, "No, I haven't seen it yet." And he said, "You know, it's a funny thing. At the end, there's a scene with Cap, and all during the scene, I kept thinking of you, and it was so weird." Huh. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. And two weeks later. Another actor friend not didn't know this guy said the same thing. What? And so when I finally saw it, I said, oh, yeah, well, there's the skin tone. The voice is his voice, but it's my intonation. They blended that. Wow, oh, really? Really? Yeah, it's my That's crazy. Skin wow. And my whole neck and everything. <laughs> and so that was that was that story. So wait a second. They <laughs> took your old man features and put it on the young actor's face? Yes. yes. That's, yes. that's, that's amazing. It was a new, it's a new technique. Yeah. I, now i got to watch that movie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mike's so, next question. So okay. speak, wait a minute. Speaking okay. of that, uh, today... Someone knew he was going to be in town, brought their Captain America replica shield <laughs> and, and had him sign, him sign it. it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Uh, uh, some of my other questions have already been answered, so it won't be six questions. Good, this thank time. you. But my last question is going to go to Tim because I don't want to let him feel left out in all the situation. Is, cool. Is Tilly Pierce overrated? Cool. Jesus. Absolutely. <laughs> there you go. Oh, okay. And that's all I have. There Jesus. you go. <laughs> overrated. She's a, a civilian that wrote an account of the battle in 1888. Oh. So she's famous because she wrote a book about herself. Uh, all right, very good. Who's next now? We got some people uh, like Jenny Way didn't get to write a book. <laughs> we have uh, Ronnie Ronstadt is exactly. next from uh, Addressing Gettysburg today, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Queen Veronica, hello, Veronica. Hello, Your Highness. How are you? So, first off, thank you, gentlemen, for doing this. Um, Mr. Gorman, I was actually one of the weirdos that stopped and waved at you on the sidewalk this morning. So, <laughs> You know, he said, I, I picked him up this morning, and he said, somebody just came by and said, I had no idea who it was. But yeah, that, that was true. I, I was one realize. of the many, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> but, so, gentlemen, this question is for both of you, and it's not Gettysburg movie specific. It's more um, actor preference. I'm kind of curious, do, when you are offered or go for a role, do you prefer doing a fictional role where you can make that character your own, or do you prefer something like a General Hood or a, a Major Taylor where you have to investigate that person, try to do him or her honor, you know, that kind of uh, mentality? Just generically, not, again, not Gettysburg specific, but what's your preference, and can you, and can you elaborate why? Good question, Ronnie. Well, such a good question, they can't figure out an answer. <laughs> such, a good, such a good question. Well, I, okay. Go ahead. Okay, a horse, I like uh, historical uh, characters because I love history, and I love to delve into an actual person, um, look at his characteristics and and uh, his beliefs and, and, and kind of build on that. Uh, when you're just doing a character from, you know, it, it a lot of it is you put – you put meat on the bones of that character. Mm. You come up with imagination, and you, I, that's what I say, I put the meat on the bones of the character in the script. Very good, very good. Uh, is that it, Rick, yeah. uh, Ronnie? Well, yeah. l oh. let me, oh, let sorry, me sorry, respond, sorry. because, <laughs> uh, let, me, let me respond to that. Uh, yes, 
I, I, I don't have a preference because of, I try and do that with every character, whether it's a fictional character or not. We gotta make it, the character is us until it's not. I got cast for it, you're stuck with me, just like they were stuck with me with Hood, really. But uh, it, it, to me it's the same, it's, it, it's, we, have to, we have to build a character, which is imagination, and we have to convince you, the audience, that they're real, mm. that you believe us. So for me it doesn't matter if it's a historical character or not. It has its a draw, it's, it has its attraction. Uh, I've only played a few a few characters that were like, well, one one quick story. A quick story. Yeah, go ahead. I'm in filming Gettysburg. I'm on horseback, standing there, and there's a reenactor with his little five year old son. And this little boy looked up at me on the horse, and he said, "You know, General Hood, you would make a great Andrew Jackson." <laughs> <laughs> I've got a beard, and I'm, and I think, well, thank, I remember this very clearly. Jump 20 years later, I get a phone call, and this young man says, uh, General Hood, Mr. Gorman, um, I'd like to af offer you the role of Andrew Jackson in a film I'm making. Huh. And I said, uh, uh, excuse me, who, uh, who are you? And he told me the story, and I remembered. But it was this guy, he grew up, he wow. had a production company in Washington, D.C., where he made, uh, independent, uh, you know, um, documentaries. Uh, he made documentaries and commercials and films for companies. You know, the the in-house film. And this was for a film for the Hermitage in Nashville. And he and I, he offered me the role of Andrew Jackson. Oh, that's pretty. And cool. I thought, well, yes, of course, I I want I'd love, I'd love <laughs> to do it. And I did all the research I could, and I said, but okay. I need the job, I want to do it, I'm gonna go, but I, 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 I don't think I look like Andrew Jackson. The thing was, all I did is put some oil on my hands and go through my hair, and I look like the $20 bill. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's awesome. I mean, and it, re it really happened, this, this kid, after the, all those years, a grown up person, that I met on the set of Gettysburg. I mean, I think that's an incredible story. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I, just real quick to follow up on this. It, I've seen where actors really didn't do their homework, you know, <laughs> and, and it's horrific. Um, one time I was watching this, uh, there was a play in Kansas City, it was a Shakespeare play, and, and the guy was so bad, he turned to the audience and said, don't blame me, I didn't write this shit. <laughs> hey, uh, uh, Matt, you know what's yeah. interesting? I, I mentioned earlier that I talked to a lot of people who watched the movie. And here's something very fascinating I realized early on. Okay, Martin Sheen portrays Robert E. Lee. Mm -hmm. If someone comes to Gettysburg and is not familiar with the battle and doesn't know anything about the Civil War, they loved Martin Sheen's portrayal of Robert E. Lee. Yeah. But Civil War people who've read about Robert E. Lee all their life, and this is one thing where you're damned if you do and damned if you don't, mm -hmm. They have each their own individual idea already of who Robert E. Lee is yeah. and what Robert E. Lee should be. And so they, you know, they, the people who know, who already have a preconceived notion, tend to not like Martin Sheen's betrayal. But people who don't come with a preconceived notion love his portrayal of Robert mm -hmm. E. Lee. And, and don't There's forget, no he was playing Robert E. Lee. I, mean, I remember we discussed yeah. it all the time. Marty was playing Robert E. Lee at a specific time in history when he was ill. During but, but he's also playing Michael Shara's Robert E. Lee. He's not playing the historical Robert well, E. Lee. Well, no, Robert, no right? there's where we, we, see, we, we, we all disagree because oh. the thing was... Martin Sheen was, uh, this is opinion, of course, and I'm gonna just say it that way. Uh, Lee was sick. He just had a heart attack. He had dysentery. Yeah. He was in terrible condition. And Martin Sheen 
captured that to a T. Yeah. That's, that's what I was talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Okay, and we don't need to fight, I, boys. We I, don't I, need to fight. Oh, I, I, loved, I loved his interpretation of... Uh, of course, I, I wanted to be in the film because of Duvall. Duvall. He looked like him. No, but now, so, okay, now you said that before, and I didn't, yeah. I didn't, but now you said it again. So you wanted to be in the film because of Duvall. He was originally cast as Robert E. Lee, but couldn't do it for whatever Stalin. reason. Stalin. Yeah. He was playing Stalin. And then, uh, geez, that's like, okay, whatever. Uh, so, uh, so then... Uh, Sheen gets the job, but he doesn't have a lot of time to prepare either, no, right? he read everything, but he said to you, and I, he said the, the same thing to me. He says, I'm damned if I do, if I'm damned if yeah. I don't. Look, yeah. my father, who came from, was born in Missouri, was named James Lee Gorman. Uh, so everyone has their opinion of that Robert character. Lee, you, yeah. you, can't, you can't argue with that. It is just, you have to deal with yeah. it the best you can. And I think Martin did a hell of a job. Yeah, I do too. Not like my opinion matters on that, but okay. Uh, Rick, uh, Ricky Fowler. Hi, gentlemen. Thank you for being here. Really appreciate it. Uh, just real quick, and you've kind of touched on this a little bit already, but uh, what was your level of interest or knowledge in uh, the Civil War or American history in general prior to learning about the role or accepting the role? Well, pr very quickly, I, I grew up playing with my great-grandfather's Yankee in infantry officer's sword <laughs> and belt. And I can't tell you how many pumpkins I skewered with that, <laughs> playing the three musketeers. And I did quick draw with my other grandfather's 36 Colt pistol with CSA carved in the grips. <laughs> and as sacrilege is, I have no idea whatever happened to those wow. things. So I, I didn't grow up with them talking. They didn't talk about the Civil War. My grandparents didn't talk because it was my great grandparents right. and everything. But I had familiarity with it, and because growing an actor, when I was a little kid, I go into the movie. I see Rob. I see uh, Errol Flynn in Robin Hood, and I come home to my parents and say, "Was was there a was there a Richard the Third? Was there a Robin Hood?" And my parents. So, go to the library and find out. So I've I've been interested in history and those things because of that. Right. I mean, always. Yeah. So uh, the interest of those characters uh, or the Civil War was kind of implicit in my. I'm an American. We ought to know about that. And because I'm an actor, uh, we get to do that. So, right. And I don't know if that helps. But anyway, that's kind of the crazy idea. Now, I didn't, you know, uh, except for my great grandparents talking about the Civil War, they were children of the Civil War. Um, I, you know, I just, we had personal family stories um, that dealt with the Yankees when they came in and stuff. But um, other than that, uh, I didn't really delve into Civil War until after I got to be friends with Ron and, and you know, started reading and doing a little research. You know, I met him in 89, we did the movie in 92. There's one other thing. My grandmother, who in 1932 was still riding side saddle to town in a long gown and a plumed hat to buy her groceries, in 1932, they still had cars. She rode her horse side saddle. She was born in Virginia. They came out here in the 1870s, anything. The, her mother's favorite story, which she always would tell us, was when Sherman came through, they, were in, they lived in Georgia, and they all had to hide in the cellar. Hmm. And then the smoke coming in, and then opening up the trap door, and the whole farm was burned to the ground. Hmm. And that was a story that she told at least two or three times a week. Right. And my mother, my grandmother knew it, and she would tell, she loved to tell that story. Yeah. So that's... That was my connection. I mean, there's not much of a connection. But still, that's, no, yeah. that's a pretty good connection. specific. Uh, Rick Johnson. Thank you very much. You're uh, welcome. Again, very much appreciate your time. Uh, no when problem. You on, <laughs> when you were on set, on set uh, around set, were there any situations where there was a near miss or an injury or something that wasn't intended? Uh, maybe not known that's uh, on a blooper reel or something like that? No. We, we, we saw that you've seen the one where uh, Pickett's horse goes yeah. down, and, and that was real. That was, you know, yeah. they just captured that. 
Uh, that was a good save on Stephen Lang's part. Save. He kept You know, going. one of the best things, I'm sure you all know that, that the scene where uh, Lee comes out and all the troops are coming up and saying, Lee, Lee, Lee. Oh, I was on the set watching them film that scene. And Improvised that, the whole that thing. Cool, that happened. It, that was not staged. That was not supposed to be a scene in the movie. And I was standing next to Ron. Ron said to the cinematographer, says, he had told him to keep the, the, the camera going. Right, but you know what happened? So this was, Ron, okay, so I was already going home. I was already out of my uniform. And I was, but uh, Lee had not taken his beard off yet. Ron comes in and says, the, um, the reenactors are kind of, they're having a hard time today. They're, they're not doing well. They're, they're kind of, would you get on the horse and just ride out there and, and, and just, you know, interact with them a little bit? And, of course, Marty goes, well, of course, you know. So he just gets on his horse and uh, he rides out there. And it was never planned. But everybody came out from the tree line, and they were like, "Yeah!" So then he got, you know, charged, and then, yeah. and then it was like, wonderful. I mean, yeah. It was yeah. like so Ron spontaneous. Like, so they're really uh, reacting said, Get to a Martin on Sheen being that close to the, them, not they're, Robert E. They're, Lee. They're, they're in their image of Robert E. Lee is there, and they're there. How neat is that? Yeah. That is I mean, cool. so it was authentic. It wasn't bullshit or not. I was a little pissed. Acting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Damn! <laughs> I was like, listen, I have one anecdote I forgot. This is away from the question. You know in the scene where Hood is wounded, it's after he's been wounded and he's in the hospital and all these, a scene that should take about, you know, an hour to film, it took all day. And uh, I had met uh, the actor Lee Marvin and, uh, and uh, oh God, I was going to tell you a story, and my I'm getting old. Here. I can't remember. Another famous actor you would know very well if I told you <laughs> told me never get comfortable in a scene. He says, "I always, if there's a chair, I lean against it, so I'm not relaxed because I want to be like I want to be sharp. Even if the guy is relaxed, I don't want to be inside. I want to be ready to deal with everything." So I'm thinking, well, I'm going to do this scene. I'm going to be uh, on on laudanum, and I'm going to be in. I'm, I'm wounded, and I'm delirious. I picked up a rock from the driveway there, and I put it in my underwear, right on the <laughs> cheeks, <laughs> and, and lay because I had to lay on the door for this scene. And every time I would start to get comfortable, I would roll over, and then I'd feel it sharp. Yeah. And that scene went very well. It was very good. But it was very good because I really was in pain. There's <laughs> <laughs> not a lot of acting in that part. No, saying. not a lot of acting. <laughs> and that scene took its good thing I did because if you're playing someone who's drunk or on drugs, you tend to get like this, mm. and the scene can go down the tubes because there's no energy. But I, I, I played that, but I had that underneath. Yeah. And it actually the worked. Of the pain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. Was, that was neat. I mean, yeah, that's good. All right, uh, who do we got next there? Uh, Mike Eisenhut, it looks like. Mike Eisenhut, author of Brothers of War, the Iron Brigade at Gettysburg, a novel. Go ahead, Mike so, so Eisenhut. First of all, thanks for coming, you guys, and you too, Matt. Thank you. <laughs> I beat you to that one. <laughs> <laughs> first that's of all, so Gettysburg, rude. greatest movie ever made by far. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, and I mean that. But I, this is for Bo, even though I think that uh, they already they threw rocks down on us and they're coming, you know, we should go around on the right. I think we're two of the greatest quotes in movies ever. But uh, this is for Bo. And I'm, I was just going to ask if this was how many takes you did on this one. It's, uh, I, I got to read it. You just walked out of, and, and did it up to General Lee. Uh, breakfast, sir. Flapjacks and small mountains, fresh butter, bacon, apple butter, all compliments of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. An awesome line, one of the best in any movie. Did you take that several times, or single take, or? Funny that you should be. And did Walter Taylor really say that? Yes, sir. Okay, so, yeah. And thank you guys. So, okay, first of all, that was the first scene. Microphone. The film. Microphone. That was the first scene filmed in the movie. First scene. I had uh, just closed a play in Cincinnati, took the red eye, to uh, and it was picked up by a van, and I, you know I got home. I got in my place at three o'clock in the morning, and I was up at five, 
And it was about six o'clock or six thirty. We shot that that scene. It was the first scene shot in the film. And so I was, uh, I, I knew, I had known Marty Sheen for about four or five years before we did the movie. I knew him really well, so I felt very comfortable with him. And um, you know what? It just, it just rolled off my tongue. I mean, I think we did two or three takes and that was it. Yeah, you know, I didn't fluff my lines or anything. I just like went right into it. And I think Lee, uh, 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 Maxwell kind of adjusted the scene a little bit uh, once or twice and we did it three takes and yeah, that was it. Like when you do battle walks here, sometimes they'll have like a concession truck fall around with like Fritos and bottles of water. They'll open up the hatch and it'll be like a hundred guys sweating. Though. And some of the guys will quote that same line. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you the, the worst thing that happened to me on that set. Well, you know, I got all that out. No problem. Just boom, boom, boom. Right. Okay. Three weeks later. All I had to do, I don't know if it's in the movie anymore. I, I had to walk from uh, Lee's tent down a hill. And under another tent were Behringer and everybody, and all the, the uh, generals were looking over a map, right? So I don't even know why he wanted to do a one. It's called a oneer. The shot is called a oneer. It's when the camera, we had a, 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 a technocrane following me from the, the, so this is, I'll just set it up for you. The, uh, the, um, the camera starts up the hill on a technocrane, huge, huge piece of equipment. It follows me down this hill and into the tent and then it uh and so but before it goes into the tent all these horses come by one way and a, a bunch wagon of wagons and six team of horses like that and then the technocrane pushes up under the the tent and my line is general longstreet <laughs> general lee would like to see you that's it. That huge freaking shot for my one line. And you're shooting 35, which means every take is about $15,000, you know, with, with the film and, and all the extras and all the, the people going by and the, the horses. It takes about 20 minutes to, to set that scene up. So I get down there. Just as the, the camera's coming through and, and fixed on me, and I look at Behringer, and he looks at me and crosses his eyes. <laughs> <laughs> and he's off camera. And I went, <laughs> General Lee would like to see you. And I hear Ron Maxwell go, God, what was that? What? Bo, what'd you do? I'm like, he's making faces at me. <laughs> he goes, Tom, stop it. Yes. So then, I think you were there. Yeah, we did another take. <laughs> and this time, everybody was making a face. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I yell, I hear cut, and, and I see Ron just fall out of his chair on the ground. No kidding. And he was like, he came up, he was like, okay, I know, this is really funny, guys, but... Please, Bo, for God's sakes. It's one line. It's one line, please. So the third time we got it. And it was one line. It cost $60,000. $60,000. <laughs> dollars Speaking of lines, uh, very well. Uh, Tell me about very well. You know, that was a thing that we all kind of got into. I, I'm, a, I'm a screenwriter, so I rewrote just about every scene that me and Martin did. Seriously. Um, we would run through the lines, and I would, I would you know, kind of rewrite it a little bit where it flowed a little better and I would always go to to Ron and say hey how can we do this and he'd look over and go oh I like that much better yeah just go for it so we started saying very well to each other me and Lee <laughs> and then other people started saying it so after about a week everybody was like very well because they could throw in a, every actor wants to say as much as they can on on film I've never seen it you know like when you see um, all the actors when they hear when they hear a, 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 a distant sound, they always look towards the camera, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they like, they just pose out. It's like, no, that's not what you really do. You're just like, oh, shit, what was that? <laughs> Did you, there's, there's fire on that hill. But, you know, you wouldn't like these poses, <laughs> you know. So everybody's trying to get as much time on camera as they can. So that was a little very wells, you know. Uh, they're just thrown in. Very well, very well. Finally, Ron came up and said, "Guys, please, you're killing me with the very wells. No more very wells." <laughs> like, yeah. 
And, you know, if you listen to it, it does kind of stick out a little bit. Yeah. It's like all these people are very well. A lot well. of very wells. Yeah. But it seems like they kind of taper off towards the middle of the movie. So that must have been when he yelled at you. <laughs> <laughs> they do. They do. They do. <laughs> all right. Uh, next on the list, we've got Eric N. Oh, Arju Arjuski? Is that right? Did I say it right? Yeah. Arjuski. Okay, very good. Eric, he's over here. Oh, did I miss somebody? You skipped two people, as a matter of fact. Oh, oh my God. I, and this oh. is the order I copied from your Yeah, notebook. no, you're right. Well, yeah, but you didn't copy it the way Why I wrote it. Now? I wrote it all over the place. Well, he's over by the mic. Hang on there. Have a seat. No, right there. Oh. Eric, there. Go ahead. Have a seat. Right there. All right, go ahead. Steve, uh, Steve Byers. Sorry. Uh, Head uh, of the Address in Gettysburg Book Club, by the way. Thanks. Uh, so for both of you guys, why do you think Gettysburg was so successful compared to gods and generals? Boy. Well, we've been talking about that, actually. Um, Gettysburg was about one thing. It was about Gettysburg. And we didn't move around a lot. It was just really right here. When we did Gods and Generals, we were all over the state of Virginia. We were in Maryland, you know, all these different battles. And I think, you know, Ron, I love him to death. He's a dear friend. He was trying to do way too much. He wanted to, he really wanted to make an epic. You know, his, he wanted to be historically seen as like a, a DeMille or something. Mm. He just wanted so badly to make this giant epic. And he tried to put too much in it. And, um, you know, heck, I, you know, uh, what's his name? Egged him on. Every time he'd go to uh, what Ted Turner, you know, go, Ted, I really want to get this other battle in. Well, yeah, let's do it. And, you know, Warner Brothers was pulling their hair out, of course. I did, they, did, they did the assassination of Lincoln. They did a whole, that was yeah. the whole, oh, all that beautiful stuff. stuff. The yeah, whole assassination great. of Lincoln. Well, that's Lincoln. in the director's cut, I think, well, isn't the it? Thing, yeah, it so. No, it's not in Oh, it's not? Uh, no, the thing is, the movie, that movie should have been a, t a series. Yeah. And it would have worked. But look, if you're not interested in the Civil War, I had people say this to me. He says, look, one bearded general talking to the troops is like one different, they're all the same. Right. Who are they? I mean, well, I don't get it. If you're not, a, you know, Civil War reenactors will, they'll watch a movie or anything about the Civil War if you make it with toy soldiers and blow cigar smoke across it and, <laughs> and, and yell and sing, make rebel calls, they'll watch it. But th those people can't m sell a movie. I mean, you know, to the... Yeah. But it was no. too much. It was way too much. Yeah. It, was, it was well done, but too much. It didn't work. No. John. The pacing was horrible as well. Sorry. John, your turn. Just ready to go. First of all, yeah, I think, thank you for being here for us. And uh, I was one of those background artists. Uh, <laughs> thousands or whatever we were i think my camera time was about one second in the middle middle of the movie i'm in the uh and 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 you don't even know this watching a movie we were the uh 124th new york color guard mm. we're being chased out of devil's den by the first texas that was one of those oh, days well that was the him part when the when the part yeah, yeah when the park service uh closed uh, devil's den down uh uh for the filming that day. Have you a question, John? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Some people like And you've, you've already addressed this to some degree, both of you. Uh, how, how did you prepare for your role as a historical figure? Is there anything you can add that you haven't mentioned thus far? No, I mean, I, 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 as I, I said I did, I read every book I could get and every reference that I could scout and I had a number of, I had three or four months to do that, so I, I was really well, well read and backed up. But as I said, it was the reenactors who really cemented that. They gave me, they tied a lot of things together that I, that helped me understand. But that was part, you know, it was serious research. I, I, I can commend myself for doing that. I know I did everything that I knew how to do. Uh, but it doesn't, it's never enough. But I don't know. It wasn't like that guy doing Shakespeare. Right? <laughs> no, but, um, you know, uh, Berenger did uh, a lot of research, and, and he has a real thing about actors not doing their homework. And so when I met him, you know, he was, he really, he, he gave me the quiz. You know, I mean, he really wanted, 
because he'd already studied my character. He wanted to know what I knew about his character and what I knew about my own character. So huh. we're standing in a circle. There's about three or four of us, and <laughs> you know the story. So don't say his name. <laughs> no, I'm going to. Oh, don't say his name. I'll bleep it. <laughs> so Go ahead. George Lazenby <laughs> walks up in our circle and with his uh, you know script writers and says, "Hey guys, do any of you know if uh, my character dies in this movie?" <laughs> <laughs> And Tom uh -oh. Berger looked at him and puffed his chest out and did an about face and walked away. <laughs> Wouldn't have anything to do with him the rest of the movie. <laughs> but he turned out to be a really sweet guy, and he'd gotten the, the, the job late and hopped on a plane, and he was trying to read the script on his way uh, here. So he didn't so, have time. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so he had no time to delve into it, but it, it was hilarious. Yeah. He didn't, he didn't I mean, know the first thing about that character. Yeah, it was no. Pettigrew is who he played. Yeah, Pettigrew, Pettigrew. Yeah. but it was hilarious because we're all like, what? And for those of you who are playing the Tim Smith, Tim Smith quiz, Pettigrew was James Bond. Yes, but it was, yeah, he was the yeah, second. I think in Her Majesty's Secret Service. Yeah, yeah, and it was a flop. And, you know. um, and by the way, since we mentioned the, the quiz that I put, I put that on the tables to distract your attention because everybody came at the same time and they knew we'd have trouble getting everybody's drink together. So it was supposed to detract, distract you. Well, now you know, you told minutes. them the secret, Tim. But um, uh, <laughs> he manipulated them. Uh, you know, um, on the quiz, you know, I made some really hard uh uh, you know, put some really hard things on there, and I hope that everyone got Jacques Dubois on the quiz. Did anybody? Does people? Do people not know who that was? Okay, well, let's tell the Beth, story. Beth is raising her hand. She who knows. Was, okay, don't say it though, but let him tell the story. Uh, who is Jacques Dubois? Jacques Dubois was the champion. <laughs> microphone, microphone. Oh, Jacques Dubois was the champion fencer of France. <laughs> And he challenged the funds to a duel <laughs> on Happy, Happy Days. Days. Yes. <laughs> that was you. That was me. Yeah. Gee, I thought you were talking about a streetcar named Desire. <laughs> <laughs> Stella. All right. So, so you got to play. What was I don't remember. The, I've just seen that scene. But what was the premise of that episode? Like, how do you get to fence the funds? Well. I came to put on a, an exhibition of fencing for this university, and I didn't have any worthy opponents. So none of them could, my chambermaid could have beaten them. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, the, the Fonz, you know, the Ron Howard's sister kind of took an, uh, she was attracted to me, but I was, ah, very, yeah. I was very, I was very rude to her. Uh -huh. And so I got challenged to a duel, and then Ron Howard reeled my, I don't know how to duel. And then, so it ended up with the fun. The but fun. It, was a, it was a fun episode. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. It was. All right. You got another one, John? Are you done? Uh, well, I'm, well, I'm not inviting you to take another one, but you got another one? I want to get Tim riled up. Uh, how are your ghost tours going? Pretty good. <laughs> Tim's ghost tours. All right. Uh, next one. Now we go on to Eric. Eric, hand the mic to Eric. There you go. You did it. Okay. Thank you so much for being here tonight. It's, it's an honor to be with you guys. Uh, You're welcome. Th thank you, sir. <laughs> Thinking about Gettysburg and your exposure to reenactors wearing frock coats, wearing kepis, slouch hats, sabers, all that. Then fast forward 10 years to gods and generals. Was gods and generals harder for you to, to play? Or was it easier, because you've already been there, done that with the reenactors? Or was was it a letdown for you? Or comparing the two? I know we're at Gettysburg, you say, I love Gettysburg, but what 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 was was gods and generals worse for you to, to play? <laughs> <laughs> worse. No, no, it, it, that, that didn't enter into it, because you get cash. You may. Re I read the script. I knew. I knew what what we were doing. But I only reservation I had. I actually had the reservation. I said, "This is a lot." That's the only thing. But what I had to do was very little. <laughs> actually, I was disappointed in a way, but not in the script. I didn't have the the knowledge or the expertise to evaluate that. But after I saw it. I, I did. I knew that it should have been a series and not a movie. But uh, as far as my 
approach to the character and everything, it was, it was the same. I mean, I, I didn't have to do more research. I continued. I found myself in my whole life after that film that whenever I read anything about the Civil War, I always, my first question in my mind was, well, where was Hood when that was going on? Which is a very interesting way to read history of the Civil War. Because I, I, I was not a big uh, scholar of the Civil War, as you have heard from the conversation. I, had, I knew about it, I knew a lot yeah. about it, but I wasn't a scholar by any means, and I'm still not, but I, I've read a great deal, and I continue to, but I always have that perspective, which is neat for me. Well, where was Hood? That's a nice perspective from it. But anyway, I don't think that helps. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. All right. Next, we have the wonderful associate producer of this show, Cindy Etzcorn. <laughs> Listen, before before you get your question in, Cindy, we have to... Uh, Patrick would not be here if it weren't for Cindy and Bill. More Cindy. Uh, <laughs> for offering the airline tickets that flew him out here. Uh, she won them. She's a frontline hero, right? Is that what they call you? Uh -huh. She's a nurse, and she won them. Uh, she was nominated as a frontline hero, and she won the tickets, but couldn't uh, use them or didn't want to use them or whatever it was. She heard me talking to Bo saying, oh, I'd love to get Patrick out here, and then she came up to me 20 minutes later, and she goes, I got tickets for you, you whining little bastard. And... <laughs> And here he is. And so, and she booked him and organized the whole thing and everything. And then Pete picked him up. It's great. And thank you very much, Cindy. It's all about you, Cindy. All right, what's your question? Okay, so my question is for any one of you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> what would you like to see as the next Civil War movie? <sighs> great question. You know, I. Oh, uh, you guys. Sorry. So, so right now. Um, Microphone, Bill. Right now in our social cancel situation of woke, uh, Civil War movies are almost impossible to get made now, in and so certainly in Hollywood, right? I saw one a few years ago. I was invited to a little premiere of a, of a the movie, if you can, you, it's, it's online, you can download it for, you know, it's rent, for rent. Um, the one uh, the, about the, the retrieval. The retrieval, yeah. And I loved it. It was a terrific little Civil War movie. It was it was heartfelt. It was well done. You know, it was shot in Texas with uh, reenactors. The movie was made for two hundred thousand dollars. It was awesome. It was about a run. It's called the retrieval, and it's about a uh, runaway slave who uh, he goes across. He goes into. Um, this kid goes into enemy territory and, and uh, brings this guy back on the pretense that his wife is ill and dying, but he actually got uh, paid to bring this guy back because the, the slave owners really wanted him back so they could kill him. And, and it is absolutely one of the best Civil War movies I've ever seen. A $200,000 film. So. You know, you can still make them and, and, you know, you can get them out there and they'll still make money. I'm surprised that, that uh, a lot of the Civil War people hadn't, uh, you know, uh, enthusiasts haven't seen this film because it's really good. Uh, I saw the trailer. It's pretty good. Did you see the trailer? The trailer, yeah. yeah. You told me to put it on my list and I haven't gone to it yet, but oh, okay. I saw the trailer. So, but, but um, you know, here's the big problem with Civil War. See, this was a different niche. This had a whole different thing to it. You know, it was about a, you know, a runaway slave and a, and a kid paying to bring him back to the, the owners. That was a great little story within with the, uh, with the Civil War's the background, right? Uh, we've already done it with, uh, with the troops, you know, squaring off and, you know, shooting at each other. We've already, we've already made Gettysburg, and that was one of the more successful ones. And Getty, uh, Gods and Generals... We knew that we weren't going to make the third installment after that movie came out. Warner Brothers said, you know, don't dress for the next film, <laughs> you know. Um, so, you know, America just wasn't that interested in, 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 you know, gods and generals. But there are other areas that you can make Civil War movies that, that aren't about these troops. And, and there's a book 
there, it, there's a book about after the Civil War here. This is what interests me as a, as a movie idea. Uh, it's about the provost marshal who came in right after the, uh, the Battle of Gettysburg. Mm. Oh, that's that's its one. own drama. Yeah. It is an amazing drama about what happened to the citizens of Gettysburg after the battle. It was horrific. They were in the middle of their own war. You know, you could smell the, the death all the way to... Uh, Kingdom come. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean <laughs> the, in Harrisburg, they smelled the, the odor of death. Uh, so there was a the, stuff like that. You know, and you can show how horrible war is that way without having to, the, battle. the battles of people shooting at each other. Because we've already seen that, you know, guys in beards shooting at each other. <laughs> Grabbing their heart when they get shot. Oh, <laughs> you know. All right. What's interesting is the cleanup. I think that's a great, you know. Yeah, that would be a good one. Yeah. The cleanup. So there's other ideas out there that, and I think they'll come around and, and you know, yeah. All right. Uh, well, last one. Uh, Joe Denise. Joe Denise, uh, where is he? Oh, there he is. Hey, Joe. How are you? Doing well. Great. What do you got a question? Whose question you got? Yeah, but so this is a general question. I would say it's more of a lighthearted question. Uh, regards to when you would come here uh, after shooting on Friday nights. What was your favorite drink, or what was the favorite shot that people would toast to when they when they would you know? You know? Uh, well, I drank mostly tequila, and I I, I drank tequila and grapefruit juice, and uh, I bartended a lot behind that. You that know, sounds I'd, disgusting. I'd hop behind the bar and. and were they playing? A, were they playing a Kokomo when you? you know? <laughs> <laughs> Sam Elliott would sit on a stool in the corner over there by the coolers. You, and, you roundhouse uh, kick someone out? Uh, yeah, yeah. He and uh, this old cowboy LQ, and uh, they would sit there and, you know, chew the yarn and spin the yarn. And, and uh, you know, I bartended a bunch. And, and you know, we'd close the place down. You know? uh, just... Surprised you didn't burn the place down, some of the stories <laughs> I've heard. Uh, another one? That it? That's it. That was it. All right. Thank you very much, Joe. Thank you to all the people who uh, questioned. And. Uh, We have to thank all of you for coming out here tonight. This was a lot of fun. Um, we might do it again because I had a good time, and I think you did too from what I hear, and uh, I'm glad for it. Uh, I'd like to thank a couple of people first. Uh, we got John John Pinkerton over there. Uh, if it weren't for John, uh, he was a he's the connection that I have. You, you hear me mention him on the show. He's the connection that I have to a lot of the actors that have been on the show. So John John Pinkerton, thank you very much. <laughs> Cameron Mallow for his folksy ways. Uh, and then, of course, uh, let's see. Oh, my mom's here. Mom, thank you for coming down. That means a lot to me. Only member of my family that came down here, by the way. <laughs> So she gets the halo. Uh, and then, of course, Patrick and Bo. And uh, I mean, and thank, thank you very much, guys, for coming and doing this. And my guest co host for the day, Tim Smith. Uh, he helped me put this together. He helped, yes, let's big one for Tim. A lot of people, you know, you know that uh, Bo and Patrick and many others are the stars of the movie Gettysburg, but Tim Smith is the star of the town of Gettysburg. There we go. Yeah. All right. And then uh, that's about it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. I hope I didn't forget anybody. If I did forget someone, I'm sorry. I had a lot to think about this week. So forgive me if I did, but thank you nonetheless. And uh, that's it. Have a good night. And hey. If you want some stickers, the kid there with the <laughs> with the uh, forge cap on, he's got some stickers for you because you know people like stickers for the laptops and stuff. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Good night. Instead of spawn, we trip down and pay the reckoning on the man. No man forget shall go to 